Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. My name is Shane Moss. I have two fantastic guests joining me today. The first one has been on the show uh, once before, uh, uh, seems like so long ago. Zach, what year was that? Do you have any idea? I think it was idea? 2017. That's a good guess. I, I think it was. Yeah, that sounds about right. 2017, um, Portland Bridgetown Comedy Festival. Uh, I had a live Here We Are podcast. And Zach, you, it was, it was the last... I think that was the 10th year of the Bridgetown Comedy Festival, my favorite comedy festival uh, in in the country. And then it ended um, after that after that year. So no one's blaming you specifically, but <laughs> it might have been a factor. Um, so uh, first of all, Zach, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to the listeners, especially since you've been doing so many different things since you were on here three years ago yeah for sure thanks for thanks for having us and seems like this is quite a while ago so i'm um i'm an anthropologist also an interdisciplinary behavioral scientist i'm a research fellow at the institute for advanced study in toulouse in toulouse france um, and it's um, an interdisciplinary research institute so we have anthropologists and psychologists and political scientists here and uh, most of my work focuses on the evolution of leadership and leadership and followership in small-scale societies, um, how leadership emerges, how it made, how it's maintained. Um, and I'm, I'm primarily interested in how um, leadership and individual behavioral strategies sort of interact with cultural and social norms in the process of cultural transition. So populations change over time and social norms and, and cultural norms shape that, but individuals do as well. So that's what a lot of my work focuses on. I do field work in Ethiopia and I also do a lot of cross-cultural uh, comparative studies. Awesome. Manveer Singh is also joining us today. Manveer, would you introduce yourself to the good people? Yeah, so I, like Zach, am a research fellow here at the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse. Like Zach, I'm also an anthropologist, a behavioral scientist, interdisciplinary more broadly. My research examines essentially the link between mind and culture. And I'm especially interested in the diversity of cultural practices that seem to pop up everywhere yet exhibit striking similarities. So I ex examine music, shamanism, witchcraft, story, these practices that each society seems to build yet seem to echo with some kind of common human strumming mm. and like zach i also do field work so i conduct field work in western indonesia and like zach i'm also interested in comparative stuff so i do the detailed work and then i'm also interested in the forest uh the word witchcraft will al always make a person's ears perk up but what's the difference between witchcraft and just any other type of religion or religious practice or yeah so i mean it of course just depends on how you define it people will use witchcraft in a number of ways some people might just use it to mean any kind of esoteric occult practice um but a common use is that it is some kind of magical practice that has some kind of malicious bent to it so you're doing spells to harm another person you are um, at night, you know, changing into an animal and attacking people. So when I specifically used witchcraft over there, I meant any kind of these beliefs in mystical harm, that when something goes wrong, it's because someone else in your group is using supernatural powers or magic. But, you know, I think there it was 2017 like more, in this more broad way. Uh, so so you have a bad day or there's like a new infectious disease or or um, someone's uh, uh, someone's livestock uh, like gets stolen or something like that, and and they go, wait a second, who's been casting spells around here? That sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, 
sometimes I phrase things in a way that I, I don't expect uh, my guests to be like, exactly, you nailed it. <laughs> and that was one of those times. <laughs> No, but that's exactly it. It's like something goes wrong, whether it is. So there is like in one of my projects, I have just listed all of the examples of things that people attribute to witchcraft. And so it, it's some things that are very expected. You know, my mother dies. Um, we get this terrible illness. Um you know, someone gets eaten by an animal or, or bitten by a snake or something. But then it's also stuff like we were running in a race and I, I tripped or like I went to get my truck and as I was driving away, it broke down in the, in the, uh, in the lane or in the driveway, or I was singing, I was singing for this beautiful woman and then my voice cracked and I just felt really embarrassed. Um, uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, oh man, so many people have cursed my game. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of witchcraft cock blocking going on out there, and and usually I'm I'm the brunt of it. You have no idea how well I'd be doing with the women if it weren't for whoever is up to these spells. One of, one of the, as soon as I find out, uh, things are gonna be <laughs> looking a lot better in the love department. Uh, so so it, it's well, there's, basically there's probably a shaman that can there's probably a shaman that can sell you an anti cock blocking witchcraft <laughs> potion I, so is this i i mean as i'm thinking of yeah i used to be a factory worker and um you know you you go to the bar with with guys afterwards and and much of their life problems might be blamed on like well, oh, it's the the Mexicans are going to come and take all our jobs, or these union workers in Detroit are making us uh, those lazy factory workers make us like hardworking factory workers look better. It, it's it seems like it's just a part of human nature to uh, to <laughs> try to uh, find blame in anyone but yourself for uh, for things. So so it's just kind of um taking that and and just adding like a, a little bit of a i don't know superstitious narrative or or um mythical kind of narrative to that sort of uh um blame or or lack of accountability that we all seem to do yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> It's it's not that much different than a dog eating your homework or something like that, right? Yeah, no, it's or... like something goes wrong, and as humans, we seem predisposed to attribute misfortune to other people, to other people's intentions, um, especially people who we don't trust, who maybe if we are low status, they are high status, powerful people. If we're high status, they're like low status people who we don't trust. They're outsiders, they're fellow um, you know, they're the people who live right beyond the, the boundary. They're the people in the corner who are always looking seedy. Um, and yeah, I think it manifests as a, accusing outgroups, accusing immigrants. But also, you know, when things go wrong, economic strife like lays havoc. And then um, it's easy to point to like powerful, distrusted parties like corporations, the government, um, the the kinds of parties you were mentioning it, it can feel incredibly real for the people experiencing it and what's striking is that i think it's very easy to point at other people and to say look at that delusion look at how you think it's witches look at how you think it's jews but then when people are feeling it in the moment when things are going wrong in their life and there are stories emerging around them and they're intuitively thinking oh it's due to them that feels so true yeah I know. I feel bad for people that don't have a perfectly accurate perception of reality like I have all of the time. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 are, are there, do, do, do the um, kind of, in, in witchcraft, do they get, do they get the same praise for do you do you like thank whatever spirits or powers or whatever when good things happen as well because because that's uh, like basically the, the you know I, I was raised catholic and and the 
the kind of uh, cliche within a lot of religions is is something good happens and and you say like oh thank you god for these wonderful things happening to me and then something bad happens and you go hey who around here was sinning or whatever is it the 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 same kind of basic structure in some of these smaller tribes yeah i mean I, I, you're pointing at a more interesting thing there are two things that you're pointing to when you say that the first is that even when things go well we are still attributing it to an agent we're still saying oh god this agent who has a mind saw something and kind of intervened but there is this interesting asymmetry where we are much more liable much more predisposed to attribute negative stuff to the people around us um, than we are positive stuff. Mm -hmm. Or at least it seems so. It seems like the stories that people uh, devise for why things go wrong more often point to their neighbors than the stories for why things go right. Although, kind of what Zach was mentioning earlier, leaders, shamans can exploit that. They can say, hey, you know, today you had great game. That's because like, you know, I sold you that spell yesterday for that. Um, I can help build your story maybe through my own charisma where we're co-creating these stories and I can exploit my status, my perceived expertise to to um, give you this story and, and in doing so kind of create my own relevance. Interesting. Um, well, I... Uh, I got to get Zach in this conversation real soon too, but I just keep on having a zillion questions pop. When you mentioned like the, the seedy person, like in the corner or whatever, that that's getting the blame. Do you, (laughs) part of me is like, Oh, that person probably just like got blamed for something once started withdrawing a little bit and then got blamed for more things. And then like, Oh, okay. And like puts a hood on so that people don't notice them. And it perpetuates this, this, uh, this seediness, uh, uh, like, you know, like the same, do, do the same kind of people tend to get blamed over and over again or. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, so in the community where I work, there is, there are these two brothers and their father, and they have just been accused of witchcraft over and over <laughs> for years. And it's the case that something goes wrong. So, you know, one of them yells at someone. Then a week later, that person gets sick. Now they're accused of witchcraft. And if that, if like they don't absolve themselves of that accusation, if now the story is that they were accused and then they paid the fine admitting to everyone that they accused, that they actually did witchcraft, now they become witches. Now something else goes wrong. You know, a week later, someone else gets sick. They become the number one suspect. And this family, <laughs> they left that village. Now they live like, the, one of these <laughs> brothers lives like far away. And um, yeah, they're, they're isolated. And that promotes the sense of them being these outsiders, of them having problems with other people. This dude is also like, especially, he gets really angry and he like is very liable to yell at people. Uh, yeah. Which has really- Like witches do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> as is so typical of those witches. <laughs> oh, amazing. Well, let's go back a little bit, because um, uh, uh, I, I want to get your uh, anthropologist kind of origin stories and when both of you first um, first started uh, working with the... Because a- anthropologists have... Uh, they're like the adventurers of uh, of modern science. I feel like I mean there there's all sorts of exciting, incredible, groundbreaking this and that, like curing cancer or some other thing. But you're just sitting in a lab day in and day out and mulling through data and hoping to come up with better ideas and testing them. And you guys get to go on this incredible adventure and and uh, immerse yourself in these. Uh, new cultures that are completely different than than the world you know. Um, Zach, what was your first introduction into that world? Because had had you done uh, field work when when we first met in two thousand seventeen? Um, I had. I had okay. gone. I think only once or twice at that point in time. Um, so yeah, I mean, anthropologists definitely often are a bit of the outliers among our academic colleagues, but. You could also frame it a different way and ask, like, what the hell's wrong with us that we 
want to you know go to these dangerous, different, obscure places and um, and do this this work. Uh, I mean, for me, I guess my introduction to it was I took some time off the first time I went to college and it didn't really work out so well. Traveled and I was like woofing and you know working on volunteer farms in Japan and decided maybe I should go back to school. And then I was just like looking through the list of majors, not really super passionate about anything that I at that point in time knew about academia. Um, but I signed anthropology. It's like you can study culture. That's cool. Um, so majored in anthropology and my first anthropology class going back as a slightly older non-traditional you know bright-eyed student was with this actually renowned anthropologist Ray Hames who's just sort of at the end of his career who did a lot of the pioneering work with the Anamamo a really well-known forager horticulturist population in South America so it was just sitting in his class hearing him speak Yanamami hearing all these stories about you know big men and, and intertribal warfare and all the cool stuff that anthropologists talk about, going into his office, seeing just spears and all sorts of artifacts. Um, so I worked with him for several years uh, and developed sort of my research interests. And um, I'm still in close contact and collaborate with him in, in certain ways. And so, yeah, I worked with him and then kind of planned my graduate school trajectory. Um, although the fieldwork stuff, at least for me, it's really difficult to get fieldwork sites established and going and, and get to the field. Um, usually your your PhD advisor has a field site or a field research program that they can bring you in on. Maybe they have some funding. Uh, but I had like a real issue. There's like a big chicken and egg problem in a sense with field work funding. Because we almost need to have gone to the field site to be able to demonstrate that you can do what you want to do and that you know what you're doing to get money to go do what you want to do. Um, so it's really difficult to uh, fund field work. It's really expensive, obviously. Um, so it took me several years before I was even able to get to the field. Um, so in my mind, I'd been thinking I was an anthropologist, studying it for years and years and years before you finally even get the opportunity to to, to do what you wanted to do the whole time. Hmm. So so what was it? Uh, what was it like when you first got to go to the field? What was your first uh, field work? Um, so one of my colleagues, um, former advisors, Barry Hewlett, was setting up these new field sites in Ethiopia. And there was a population that he had heard about from some Ethiopian colleagues. They're, they're called the Chabu, but no one had been working with them uh, except for some linguists back in the 70s. So they're really relatively unknown. Um, so he and one of our Ethiopian colleagues were kind of trying to find this group of people. They were deep in the forest. They eventually kind of found where they were living and they're living among other groups, but most people kind of assume that they were a member of this other ethnic group, this more populous and kind of more well-known, but they're not. They're culturally distinct, linguistically distinct, and genetically distinct as well. And so Barry had kind of set up a, a site with the Chabu and suggested that I go to work there for a lot of my dissertation work. Um, so yeah, my first field, field season, um, kind of one funny thing, I'd been vegan at that point in time for like maybe 10 or 12 years. But I had in my mind, like, okay, I'm going to go do field work with these former hunter gatherers. You know, they spear hunt. So I prepared myself sort of, you know, psychologically and, and phys physiologically to eat meat and consume, you know, whatever they're going to eat, like a good anthropologist. And when we get there, it was corn season because um, they, they have horticulture and they grow maize as well. So for the whole time we were there, we literally ate nothing but corn. Um, so I... <laughs> Prepped to, I was prepared to eat wild pig and all this crazy forest food, and it was basically just corn for for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> um, all right, man. Pierre, what was your introduction into field work? My introduction to field work was that I started my PhD. So coming into my PhD, I was like an animal nerd. For my undergrad, I studied beetles. Most of my childhood, I was an animal nerd. Also, like, what are you, uh, what are you into? Are you into dung beetles or? I'm into dung beetles. I think dung beetles are interesting. My, for my undergrad thesis, I studied, um, uh, like flesh eating beetles, beetles that eat Ooh. carcasses, corpses. And they're cool because they, they form male female pairs. So you have like parenting and they like, find a mouse they digest. they have they have pair bonding and they invest in their offspring yeah well um i, I mean they have bi 
by parental care. Um, yeah, wow. it's an interesting case. I, I think when insects, I mean, I am not the person to like talk about insect biology because Oh, you better get all of this 100%. I have a lot of beetle researchers listening right now, and the, the pressure is on. You say one wrong thing, man, you're going to get a lot of hate mail, so <laughs> <laughs> so be um, careful. No, but I think with, with beetles and with insects, when you have to like defend small territory, high like high, rich territory that yep. is scattered, you more often have parental care. And maybe even buy parental care, but I might be wrong. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, and in in, in, uh, in a lot of speech, in a lot of mammals, if if you like, if you say eat fruit, and fruit fruit is less abundant, you tend to be more um, ab aggressive uh, and more um, more uh, more competitive. Uh, b b whereas like vegetation is everywhere, so you don't really need to compete for it um and i think that changes some mating patterns as well anyway we don't need to talk about beetles i just love dung beetles because they make me see the world in a different it's like every everything that we think of as disgusting is like their absolute favorite thing in the world and i i love that kind of reminder of the reverse perspective that nothing is like objectively kind of good or bad um uh so anyway and and insects are this great way of like getting inside of an alien mind which is a good introduction to being like the alien anthropologist to going into another world so um all right so then what happened right yeah so i studied i was like continuing to kind of study insects getting interested in humans getting interested in just evolutionary theory more generally how can we use it to explain all kinds of stuff and as I started to think that you can use evolutionary theory or an evolutionary approach to start to explain behavior, the things that I personally find so colorful and interesting about humans and human behavior are religion, myth, music, you know, all of these puzzling, colorful things. So I started my PhD. I had my little desk next to this older grad student, Luke Glowacki who is also a good collaborator and friend of Zach, and they're doing some cool projects right now. But Luke does field work in East Africa, um, in Ethiopia, and would have these incredible stories, these incredible artifacts. Um, and so during that year, I like accelerated my shifting from a zoologist to an anthropologist, especially with Luke there. And after that year, I finagled like $2,000 and flew to Indonesia. I found this one spot. I had a list of potential sites that I wanted to visit. And there was this one spot that I thought would be interesting. And I flew there and, and started my field work. Um, I remember from talking to you before, you had a little bit of like a rough go at the beginning, didn't you? Right. Didn't you bring like something or other to ingratiate yourself and like it just didn't go that well? Yeah, so I brought lots of stuff. I <laughs> I first like didn't bring nearly enough money. I brought <laughs> 10 bucks. That ought to cover the... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was chatting with this anthropologist who went in the late 90s or early 2000s, an American, to this island. And he was like, oh, yeah, you're going for two months. You'll need like 300 bucks. And so I was like, sweet, I'll take $300. And then I was also told that I wanted to bring cigarettes, coffee, sugar, biscuits. So I have this huge backpacking backpack filled with mad cigarettes and coffee and sugar and biscuits. Um, and I fly to, Indo well, that's, I have all of that. I buy all of that in Indonesia. And then I meet up with this guy, Lucky, who is somehow affiliated with the university. Like someone's like, oh, Lucky, this Indonesian dude is also going to the island and he's affiliated with the anthropology department and he can maybe find you a way to, to visit some groups, visit some communities. So I get on, we take this big ship. So I work on this island off the west coast of Sumatra called Siberut. Um, 
So you can take these enormous wooden ships and they take about 12 hours. You leave from Sumatra and then they, they head over to Siberu. So I go there with Lucky. I arrive. I'm like, I have no clue what's going on. I'm just like following Lucky. I have my backpack. I'm like 23. I'm just like, am I 23? No, I'm 24. I'm just kind of like a, a total nub, has no clue what's going on, but has all of these expectations about what this experience is going to be like. <laughs> so, like... Oh, I, 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 I love a good built-up expectation. Those, those, those things will get you every time. Yeah, they really do. They really do. <laughs> um, so Lucky like, knows someone at the dock. We get to the dock. He knows someone. I get on a motorcycle with them. And then they dropped me off at a house. I don't know where Lucky went after that. And so I walk into this house with my enormous backpack. And um, I know like really crappy Indonesian at this point. I know 900 words and like very rudimentary grammar that I've learned on the internet and from a book. Um, and so I'm like, I want to go. I want to see like the, the, the remote groups. Um, and they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. Like, we have this guy, he'll take you. It's this whole, whole crew. There's one guy who I really remember and I'll never forget him. And now I know him well. Um, he is a shaman, not wearing, no pants, just a loincloth. His body is covered with tattoos. In his ear, he has a pierced ear, but rather than having an earring, he has half a smoked cigar um, that you know, it's just poking out there. I don't even think it's actually a cigar. I think he like wrapped up tobacco and um, possibly a banana leaf. But anyway, he's like this old shaman. He's there with all of these other people. I'm like, everyone's crowding around and I have like no clue how to how to ingratiate myself. And I'm like just throwing out cigarettes, um, like handing them out, hoping that this will somehow make things better. Um, and and they like they like ear cigars. They don't even like these uh, these cigarettes, probably. Yeah, they turned out to be terrible cigarettes. Like everyone hated those cigarettes. It was presumably like such an indication of my my cheapness. Um, but but I I knew one guy that I wanted to meet. Um, he was a friend of this other anthropologist. Um, he goes by the name of Rustam. So I was like, I want to meet Rustam. Find me like where can I find Rustam? Because this other anthropologist was like, find Rustam and then he'll take you wherever you need to go. And they're like, I don't know where Rustam is. Like, Rustam hasn't been seen. Rustam lives far away. Someone, I think maybe even someone said, like, Rustam is dead. Um, and they're like, but no, don't worry. We're, we will take care of this. It turns out later that that guy, the shaman, is actually Rustam's father. Um, but they're like, yo, and Rusam's sister is also there. That's why I'm like not sure that they said Rusam is dead. But they definitely were like making Rusam much more inaccessible than he actually was. And they were like, yeah, we yeah. can take you up for five days. It'll cost like four hundred dollars. And I was like, oh, I have, I wanted to be here for several months, and I have three hundred dollars. Um, sorry, I'm going so in depth into this story. Anyway, no, I love it. Keep going. Yeah, and then I just leave. I walk. By the end of the night, I actually find Rustam. So like information gets around quickly. Someone somehow it reached up to Rustam's village that someone's looking for him. Rustam walks down. I actually, at that point, am on a motorcycle. So I've like found my way onto a motorcycle. I'm paying this guy 10 bucks to take me up to Rustam's village. It'll take two hours on this terrible road. Um, and and we're going and this, this like little dude is walking. And he's like talking to the guy on the motorcycle. And I'm like, hey, we got to go. I need to find Rustam. And the guy was like, I'm Rustam. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, then I met him. We went to his village. And then finally, he took me to the first place that we were going to visit. And I got there. It was like a several hour trek after getting to his village through the forest. You know, a six hour trek. It, I'm totally rained on. I've fallen several times. Um, I think there were leeches. There are definitely leeches in that forest. I, don't, I can't remember if there were leeches on that walk, but I just had like a terrible time. I left books outside my backpack and they're soaked, which is kind of a trivial thing. But anyway, we get to the house. I expect to like get to a village with like bubbling life and like children and like a, you know, a group of elders or whatever. And it's like a single long house deep in the forest. There are four people. There's like 
a woman and her three children. Um, and I get there and I can't talk to anyone and I'm like incredibly lonely. And after two days, I told Rustam that I couldn't do it, that I didn't, I misunderstood something and I left the island and I went to Sumatra and I called my parents and I started thinking about maybe doing field work with the Amish. It just turned out to be much harder than I thought. Yeah. I had a total expectation of what it was going to be like. And, you know, for a number of reasons, that trip was not indicative at all of at all what the island is like. You know, it's like a diverse place. And what it's actually like isn't isn't how I expected it, but it turned out to be interesting and, you know, rich in all kinds of ways. But but yeah, it was hard. It didn't embody my expectations. And I just I just felt overwhelmed and I just left. Guys, is this like a, a little bit of the uh, training of of uh, when you're first getting trained to your kind of introduction to field work? Or, I mean, it's just such a bizarre thing to do. Uh, to uh, I imagine for like the first anthropologists to uh, uh, to to go and and try to immerse themselves and ingratiate themselves with some tribe of people that have never seen someone from like another culture or whatever. That's maybe not the case these days, but at some point, it, it, many times through our history, this has happened where some like white dude or whatever is showing up in the middle. I, I mean, I, I can imagine if I get done with this podcast um, and, and some like, I get a knock on the door and it's like some Chabu dude who speaks like 20 words of English and he's like, me watch you? And then like, and like opens up his backpack and like hands me a selfie stick because he knows how much Americans love selfies and he just has a backpack full of selfie sticks for some reason. And I'm like, uh okay yeah come in like i guess you can sleep on the couch and you're just gonna watch the things that i do sure <laughs> like like how how do you get the ball rolling with that i mean historically zach can also speak to this but it was like there's this person malinowski who is often regarded as like the person who created the modern anthropological method that until then people would set up in like a missionary camp or a colonial camp and they would invite people in and interview them. And Malinowski, and many people say that the story has been, the history has totally been morphed. Other people were doing this, but the way that the this, this story is often told is that Malinowski was so revolutionary because he was the person who thought like, oh yeah, maybe I should live with this group and like learn their language and make a little tent and try to, and try to, um, enter their lives that in hindsight it, it doesn't seem like an innovation but presumably in the history of anthropology that was so momentous that both to like go out on a limb to do that to like sacrifice your life and, and be willing to really engage with a people and a culture with that kind of intimacy hmm. and that was in the early 20th century but even people like our advisors and our advisors' advisors basically had like no training in how to do this stuff. I mean, like you read Malinowski's ethnographies and whatnot, but it was still just like buy a plane ticket and show up and figure it out. And mm -hmm. in retrospect, that really doesn't, I mean, it produced some interesting work, but lots of people have had problems, people have gotten killed, people find themselves in really risky situations. And so the past few generations of anthropologists have tried to make that a little bit better. And I mean, we take field methods courses where people tell you this stuff, but I think at least in my, even in my experience, I mean, there's really no solid preparation for successfully doing anthropological field work. Uh, you just have to basically start at it and figure it out for your own self and how to at least take the ideas that people have given you and to try and put them into action. But it never goes as you would expect it to. And there's always un unforeseen problems. Um, and so you're just basically figuring out as you go. Yeah, I visited, mm. I visited Zach after, you know, doing a, quite a bit of field work. And I, you know, he just showed me his methods and his surveys. 
And I was just like, oh, damn, there is there is like basic stuff and like really cool stuff that I just was not taught that like Zach is doing. Um, and it, it, I remember. Oh, better cigarettes. Ah. <laughs> but when I started this, our mutual friend Luke really stressed and I didn't get a, an opportunity to do this, but he really stressed going and staying with an, like a, at another field site where another anthropologist has been working for a long time, see how they engage with the community, see how they collect their data. Um, I reached out to some anthropologists, none of them worked out, but, but Zach is totally right. Yeah. Like a lot of, a lot of the training you don't get until you are just thrown there onto the ground and you're figuring it out. And even like reading these books, it doesn't really prepare you. Mm. I mean, you're prepared in some ways. You're prepared in quite a few ways, but. And there's a big personality component too. Like there's not one type of person that makes a good anthropologist. There are many ways to go about it and everyone can do it kind of their own way. But going back to like your example, Shane, I mean, you show up with a bunch of crap and you don't know nothing and you're an idiot, uh, but you have to like embrace that and be willing to just be the, the sort of gesture, the cultural idiot and kind of the goofball. But that's, I think the most important thing you do that wins people over. If you show that shyness, you, if, you, if you seem like the shady person who's kind of, you know, you, you don't want to be accused of being a witch, yeah. you have to just kind of like own your ineptitude and sort of embrace it and like laugh at yourself while everyone else is laughing at you. And that's like the first step to making friends. Once you make <laughs> friends, then doors just continue to open. Kind of, that's, I don't know, that's how it went for me more or less. Uh, that's, I, I, uh, that's, uh, that's such a good strategy for not being accused of being a, a, a witch as just play out the hey hey uh the lion ate earl who who made the lion eat earl is it hey get, you guys think it was that zach no zach's too dumb zach wouldn't know how to make a lion eat there's a lot of earls in the in the uh tribe i imagine too but but how do you that's uh so so basically they just you're kind of like the court jester for for a little while that's like your best shot hey look at the guy with the he tried terrible cigarettes but it's the thought that counts and you don't pose a threat and they kind of get a kick out of you for a while or something yeah and i i think too um so Manvi and I, as kind of like evolutionary and, and quantitative anthropologists, we're also quite distinct from the other anthropologists who are more cultural and just focused on ethnography or language. And so those, those, colleague, well, those colleagues of ours, those anthropologists, they kind of just like to hang out and chill and learn the language and take notes. And the people actually like that kind of a lot more because it's just, it's very easygoing. And Manvi and I also do a lot of that work too. But you know, we do kind of quantitative stuff and lots of behavioral experiments and, and methods psychologists or economists might use, but, you know, in these fieldwork contexts. And a lot of that stuff is just weird stuff anyways. Um, but so for people who don't have experience with formal education that haven't ever filled out, you know, bubble circles on a Likert, on a Likert survey or something like that, um, these types of things are really weird. And then we ask questions about, you know, um, I mean... Try interviewing women about all their dead babies. Like, that's just never fun to talk mm. about. Um, but these types of data are really important if you want to understand, um, you know, mortality, reproduction, life history, and all these things. And so it becomes, becomes pretty, pretty tricky pretty quickly. And, and how do you know? I, w I was just in a class recently that was about um, kind of aging uh aging diseases of of the mind like alzheimer's and such and there is some super rare disease in these uh new guinea people and there was some like some guy there that was it, it, he was like this real maverick that picked up a bunch of languages and like immersed himself with these people and did all this interesting research and and um he uh he had the, the idea for a little while was maybe this has to do with cannibalism and and uh, this is why they're getting this this brain disease and then and then later on they realized that well 
the this idea of cannibalism is uh is actually they're just telling us that the neighbors are cannibals. They're just like gossiping about the neighbors eating can and that's where this idea was. And it turns out that they were like they they were doing they were like eating like someone's mom would die and they would like eat their mom or whatever to celebrate their life. But their first they they thought that uh, they they thought that like you go in and you you eat the heart of your enemies or or whatever. And this had real implications in figuring out like what is this disease? How does it work? How are you getting this? So. How how do you know when someone tells you something or like Manveer shares this story of <laughs> of looking for someone and and the guys the guy's father with a straight face is telling him that the guy is dead or isn't unreachable or or whatever how do you how do you discern what's what Yeah so I have I have for instance one project where I'm tallying up every instance of like where I work, there's this official system of, of finding someone. So, you know, you kill one of my pigs and now I demand a coconut tree and whatever. And so to do that, I, for a given case, you know, let's say one case is Shane kills Munveer's pig. I will interview as many people as I can about that case because people misremember, but they also give you what they think you want to hear. They maybe know that you are paying a small amount for an interview and will sit down and just make something up. Um, so I interview a number of people and I also make it clear to everyone that at this point, like I'm going to check what you say. Um, and, and knowing that people are, are, are more honest, but, um, yeah, but it's a tricky thing. I, I think once you, I think people do start to tell the truth more once you are around and they recognize that you are not just like a floater, you know, that you are maybe more committed to the community and you're a friend. But I do think regardless, anthropologists have to devise methods to validate, to make sure that people aren't just making stuff up. Hmm. And uh, especially with, uh, I mean, the other th thing is you, you give someone a survey about anything in any culture and it's not just... It's not just people trying to deceive. It's people have deceived themselves or have an inaccurate um, uh, version of what's going on. Or, uh, but I I remember um, the this fantastic study of of kind of implanting uh, memories in children. They had this. They had this. Uh, oh, I wish I could remember. I'm so bad with names. One one day in a future podcast. I'm going to be sitting there trying to remember your guys's names, but now you get to enjoy this moment of me forgetting someone else, another past guest. Um, she, they, they have a magician come in to like a kindergarten class. The magician's doing all these things. And then at the end of the big grand finale, he's going to pull a rabbit out of the hat. The rabbit doesn't come out. Where'd the rabbit go? There wasn't a rabbit, but uh, and then he uh, he closes the trunk. Oh well, I guess show's over early. Blah blah blah. The, he leaves. One of the one of the um, adults, what one of the like confederates or whatever is, is uh, uh, makes sure they're like talking with the teachers so that like a couple kids can overhear that like, oh the rabbit snuck out of the trunk or something like that, and then they come back a week later and interview the kids about the show and the kids swear each of them has like a story of like, and then I saw it jump out the window and then it got hit by a bus and like these dramatized stories. And as far as the kids know, they're telling the truth. Like it, that's their version of, of, of reality. And, and we're, we're such dramatizing as you talk about cursing and everything else. We, um, uh, we, um, you, you say like, oh, I could kill that person, even though you don't want to do that. You know, even like suicidal ideation, ideation that everyone's talking about is concerned about with, uh, with, with the quarantine and everything happening. Like a lot of times those thoughts are just a more nuanced, like, oh, things are a little, maybe we should question our path in life right now. The mind just tends to exaggerate 
um, so much. So it it must be it must be really difficult to um, kind of take what someone's saying from another culture and then um, kind of do you have to try to like walk it back a little bit and understand that that the truth of what they're saying is maybe a little more nuanced than what they're giving you? That was such a long, crazy question. I'm sorry. Do do whatever you want with that one. <laughs> well, I think you've, you've hit an important point. I mean, a lot of what people, too, will express with these types of questions are what we sometimes call cultural models. Um, and there can be different people have different cultural models. But in general, there'll be like sort of a norm or a model of this is kind of how this particular thing happens. So what is, what is good behavior or, or what is the right way to act in a certain situation? So to some extent, you'll get people sort of recapitulating the cultural model. Um, and so you can kind of start to see that take shape. But Mandrew had a really important point about trying to get at different, I think, sources of information to answer the same question. Mm -hmm. um, so you might get these long qual qualitative interviews where people go on all sorts of tangents. Um, but then you can also do a variety of quantitative approaches too and see if those two sources of data kind of converge. So like a lot of my work I'm interested in sort of behavioral or almost psychological traits of individuals, like who's the most respected person in the community, or who's the best hunter, who's, who's the person that fights the most. Uh, but we can take advantage of the fact that a lot of these people live in the same community their entire life. Um, most of us, I think we've probably all moved around. Um, but if you've been with the same people for 30, 40 years, there's not many secrets that anybody has. So I do a lot of, and a lot of my colleagues um, do these photo ranking methods where you take like a picture of everyone in the community, either like a Polaroid or you can do this with digital technology these days. And then you just show everyone all the photos and you say, okay, who gets in the fight? Who fights the most out of all these people? And they can pick out the person who fights the most. Okay, now who fights the most? And they can just sort of systematically create a, a hierarchy or a, a ranking for fighting. And there will be some bias in that one ranking because that's just that one person's perception of everyone. Um, but if you do that with enough people in the community, then you can statistically generate these nice quantitative measures of fighting or hunting, which, you know, you'd be better if you could just hang out for five years and record every instance of fighting, like what Manvir's doing with uh, sort of the, the violations um, and shamanism practices. Uh, but in the meantime, you can do stuff like this these sort of peer rating methodologies. And if the peer rating and your observational and the sort of ethnographic data all sort of start to um, support each other, then that gives you some pretty good confidence. Hmm. What, what <laughs> do these guys ever take an interest in kind of how uh, these studies and the scientific method works? I, I mean, I, I feel like I feel like if word got out that that um, like Phil was voted biggest asshole in town or whatever, but we're all in agreement. Look, these new scientists have come in. They've proven that Phil is the biggest dick. What do we now? What are we gonna do about this? Um, I got a quick point, Andrew. Then I'm interested to hear your perspective too. But so, and an important sort of trend in all science, but especially anthropological science right now, is like returning results to the community and including the community sort of in your research design and trying to formulate your research in a way that is, is beneficial to them or interesting to them or can be delivered back to them. Um, and I've had strong buy-in, like people who I'm working with, they almost are more com as committed to getting the data, getting the surveys done as I am. So huh. the people you're working with and kind of spending time with become like co- co-researchers in a lot of ways, and sometimes co-authors as well. But it is tricky. For example, my research, I, I've studied leaders, so I kind of have identified, you know, that there are some qualities that might be sometimes perceived negative, but leaders, you know, embody these qualities from time to time. So it's, for some topics, it's a bit more tricky, um, but other topics, it's a little easier to, to, to share results and, and broadcast them pretty, pretty widely. Manbir? Any Yeah, any I would thoughts? say that most of what I research, or a lot of what I research, they think is completely unsurprising. So, you know, I might have a paper that says the Mentawe have 
a crocodile god that attacks you if you don't share and then shamans come and ceremonies and they remove the crocodile god from the house this is how much it costs across like 12 ceremonies this is how often people go to other stuff and um they'll just be like yeah of course like that is what we have been the, telling you everyone knows <laughs> phil's the dick how many times like Phil will tell you that. Why are you? <laughs> yeah, but there there is some stuff that they get stoked about. So I, I actually do get asked ever so often, like, why are you doing this? Who will you share this with? Um, and there there is, so I, just to come back to that project, I have this project now, I have hundreds of rule violations, hundreds of transgressions. And a lot of that is like, it's pretty sensitive stuff. Um, but people also are into the idea that I am like documenting the Mentawe legal system and that I will share that. Um, and I assure everyone that I won't share like anyone's names. I won't share the actual identities of, of what the transgressions are. I'm just trying to understand how the system works. Um, and I've, I've found that people are quite into that. Um, yeah, and I think actually also doing that kind of a project has made people interact with me or trust me in a different way. Um, so I have this piece coming out in Vice. Hopefully it should be out by the time this, this podcast comes out. But in the beginning, I talked to this guy who worked with the Shipibo in Peru. And so he went there to study ayahuasca. And he moves there and he is under this impression that ayahuasca is this ancient thing. And... And he moves there and he actually marries a Shipibo woman and he starts a life there. He has children, he becomes a teacher. And so in our conversations, and I talk a little bit this in the piece, he says that after some time there, he realized that there's what he calls a double discourse. There's how the Shipibo understand themselves and ayahuasca in their community. And then there's, there's how they perform or present themselves to outsiders. Um, and so outsiders come and outsiders say, haven't you, you've been doing ayahuasca for since millennia and like ayahuasca is a central aspect of your culture right and they just reflect that back um mm -hmm. and so people kind of come with this expectation and then the shipibo embody that for them but he says mm -hmm. you interact with the shipibo you know he was living there he would go to healers when he had to but he's also a teacher he's married to a shipibo woman and he realized that ayahuasca is much less salient in their life and this guy's research is actually very cool because he has shown that ayahuasca has maybe entered the Amazon in the last 300 years. Um, but I only mention that as w when you are interacting with people in this new way, in a way that can feel personal, they can share things about themselves and they can interact with you that is maybe more sincere. Um, and so I felt like in, in digging into stuff like transgressions and with living with them, it brought up a sensitive topic, but also like created this trust. Like, yo, share with me these things that happened, um, I will not broadcast them, but, you know, I want to document your culture. And then you sit down with someone and you tell them, like, something that's hard. I guess I'm just reflecting on it, and I do feel like it kind of created a, a new kind of relationship. Hmm. Well, you just uh, opened up Pandora's box with uh, with psychedelics. Now the listeners are... are now I'm going to get hate mail if we don't get into psychedelics and shamanism and all of that stuff. So uh, some some stuff, which is going to be just this heartbreaking disappointment to so, <laughs> so many, <laughs> so many listeners uh, th that um, I, and and the more I so so I got I got into um, uh, I, I had I had done psychedelics for, uh, you know, starting when I was like 16 or something. So 24 years ago or something, never read anything about, I, I never got immersed into the whole, like, um, reading every book I could about psychedelics and everything else. And, but I, I put a show together, started learning about the modern, um, research, just like MDMA for PTSD and all this other stuff. And then, within immersing yourself in in the um, um, like psychedelic like burning man ish kind of community that's out there this is a big popular narrative um that uh, there's like this stoned ape theory uh that that mushrooms perhaps played this 
role in helping form our our uh, kind of linguistic sophistication and and uh, or or maybe they were a part of of uh, uh, you know maybe maybe that that uh, because the, there's all this terrific neuroplasticity and we're trying to um, we're we're trying to describe these profound experiences within doing that 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 was um, uh, something that was selected for through sexual selection or who knows what but what we definitely know within the psychedelic community is that psychedelics have been around in, in, in human life for a very long time, and this is what our ancestors were doing. And, uh, and, and you guys might, uh, might walk that back a little bit with, with some of what you've uh, come to understand, right? Yeah, so, I mean, there was this incredible researcher, Martin Fortier. He was a cognitive anthropologist a philosopher. He was interested in altered states of consciousness. He was this French student. Um, and he learned about, of course, you know, you engage in, even in a lot of anthropology, you run into these stories that religion started with psychedelics, that core features of human social and psychological evolution started with psychedelics. So he built what he calls, what he called the hallucinogens, um, Hallucinogen use, hallucinogenic use throughout history and across cultures database. So he went through missionary reports, he went through old ethnographies, he went through the, the travelogues of explorers, and he tried to find in the world where are psychedelics consumed, where are hallucinogens more generally consumed. Um, mm. Really tragically, Martin died earlier this year in April at the age of 30. So when I first mm. got in contact with him about a year and a half ago, he had just found out that he got cancer um, and he mm. had already been working on the project. And he was, he was at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is like a, a cool place for cognitive anthropology. Um, but he unfortunately passed away. But in January, he posted his preliminary findings of where, you know, in his in-depth research, where does he find psychedelics? Where does he find, in, in particular, serotonergic? Um, you know, drugs that activate the serotonin, serotonin 2A receptor. So DMT, um, psilocybin, all of the classic psychedelics. And he finds that they are restricted to the Americas. So you find them nowhere else in the world. Um, nowhere else in the world do you find evidence of classic psychedelics being consumed by communities to the present day. In the Americas, he estimates that 5% of cultures in the, in the Americas were consuming them. So th those are maybe people consuming snuff, um, people consuming peyote, and people consuming mushrooms. Um, the ayahuasca evidence is, is also unclear. And what we are increasingly very confident of is that at least ayahuasca was not throughout the Amazon um, very deep into time. You can actually trace its movement. You can look at the words that are used for ayahuasca. You can look at the structure of the songs. And it really looks like it diffused in the last 300 years. But anyway, the point of Martin's research is that we tell these stories for thousands of years, for millennia. Humans around the world have been consuming psychedelics and they have changed our minds and our evolution. Actually, less than 1% of human cultures, as far as we know, have been consuming psychedelics. All of those are in the new world. Um, if we expand to hallucinogens more generally, we can maybe include some consumption of ibogaine by, by select groups in Africa. We can include muscarinic mushrooms consumed by various Siberian groups, but it's still incredibly trivial. And what's also very striking is that humans have lived in many environments where there are psychedelic substances. Um, so in Australia, I don't know this very well, but I think there are trees that have DMT. There are some kind of substances that are psychedelic, and there's no evidence of people consuming them. Um, mm. Again, there's no evidence anywhere except in the Americas. Um, yet, where people are so attached to that story. They're also really attached to this idea that like shamans are using psychedelics for social and psychological healing. Uh, to anyone who says that, there's a great video on YouTube of Yanomama shamans snorting DMT snuff and then killing the souls of babies in the neighboring group um, that I 
there is just like a, a romanticism. There are just like myths yeah. that people like to tell that really justify and make convenient um, this use. And I think they really misrepresent cultural diversity in the actual practice. Hmm. So, well, Zach, if if people aren't selecting their tribal leaders by their um, psychedelic tolerance, then what in the world do people want in a leader? I don't understand. Right. Yeah, and um, just one other side note to that larger point is yeah. that th that's kind of one of these myths that we sort of attach to um, traditional indigenous sm small-scale groups. And there's a whole series of them that just keep getting perpetuated by really, you know, well-known intellectual journalists are quite guilty of this oftentimes. Um, I've done yes. it myself. That's a feature. I mean, I didn't edit my documentary and pick the, but you know, we, we did a, we did a zillion different, uh, uh different interviews, um, with people. And, you know, my, my editor picked the things that he thought were like the most interesting sounding things and fun sounding narratives. And, and that's one that just tends to rise to the surface. Yep. Um, and yeah, we, we see it all the time. Um, but in support of everything Manavi just said, I one of these cross-cultural studies I've done, we looked at what are the actual qualities of leaders across a broad range of cultural types, you know, North American hunter-gatherers, African kingdoms, and you know, everything in between. Um, and I, yeah, supporting all that, drug consumption was one of the variables we found evidence for, but it was basically the least frequent of all the variables we found evidence for across thousands of paragraphs, you know, thousands of descriptions of leaders across hundreds of documents from about from 59 cultures. There was just like a few instances that leaders were known for some drug taking propensity. And I think even a few of those was basically like, he has to be able to hold his liquor good, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the qualities that are really frequent are like, intelligence is super, super common. Um, good decision making and decisiveness and um, generosity. Um, supernatural abilities are quite common too. So, and we also see in some cases coercion or aggressiveness. Uh, so there's a, there's a few different sort of suites of traits that are often good for leadership in, in different contexts. And then a few that are kind of broadly universal. Are there things that are um a big contrast from how you see our modern world in terms of in terms of what um, what say we look for in leadership in America or in European countries compared to um, smaller tribal communities. Well, I think the the biggest difference that's really relevant for thinking about differences between um, post-industrial and let's say non-industrial groups is that in non-industrial contexts, uh, people often have like a direct say in selecting their leaders. Mm -hmm. um, so maintaining a position of leadership is dependent upon serving collective interests directly. And people have this track record. Um, they, they keep track and they can share information about leaders' behavior. And if leaders aren't getting the job done, they can effectively remove them. So you don't have, there's just no mechanism by which a leader could really uh, try and enforce or coerce. And now I'm being overly general here, um, but in general, that's, that's kind of the case. Um, whereas in post-industrial context, there's a, there's a large disconnect between the higher, higher levels of authority and decision-making and the lower levels of day-to-day of -day behavior that are affected by that decision-making process. Zach, mm -hmm. I have a question. Can I ask you a quick question? Just building Absolutely. On your last question, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, that's 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 not allowed. I'm, I'm very sorry. In fact, we're going to put you on mute here. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, so I was wondering if we evolved in context, if there is some aspect of our psychology that comes predisposed to looking for leaders. Do you think like our propensity to have something like a president, a single person? governing over 300 million people yeah. is more just a product of an evolved intuition rather than necessarily like the ideal way to, to organize a society. Do you think that there's some lag there or, or that's biasing how we think we should organize a society? 
Yeah, so there's two things there. First, I would say, yeah, definitely. Like the way nation states and sort of the global uh, political system is organized is probably not effective from like an optimal sort of economics of decision-making process. And this is probably a good example of mismatch. And so we can see all these uh, artifacts of mismatch where we have this evolved leader follower psychology, as it's often called. Um, and so we have preferences for physically tall, physically formidable individuals or more masculinized features. And interestingly, some of that stuff is independent of sex or biological sex. So there are some studies that suggest women with more masculinized features will be preferred as a leader in the context of intergroup conflict, um, whereas a male with feminized features will be preferred as a leader in a more intergroup cooperative context. So it's not necessarily gender or sex per se, but there might be some, there's some evidence that our minds are sort of queuing up, queuing in on these, you know, testosterone dependent characteristics. Um, that being said though, although there is some mismatch, we still are who we are. And so I think for a nation to have like a cohesive identity and for its, its members to have some solidarity, I think we do need that figurehead. Um, as a product of our psychology, as, as you point out. So even though it's mismatched and maybe it's effectiveness in a lot of ways, I think it's also necessary um, behaviorally and, and culturally. Wait, one more question, and then that's my last question. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> All I'm, right. I'm Whose not. podcast is this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Shane. Shane. No, that, that, that was a, that was it was a better question than any I've asked, and it was it, it's something that I have lots of thoughts about. Was interested in. So so you're you're batting a thousand so far, Hell man. Yeah. Beer. Okay. The second question is super related, and it's just building off something that Zach just said. And as Zach talks, it's just like putting into words thoughts that have just been like drifting around my mind. But the other one is so I was watching videos of Obama in 2007 or something, and he's on a talk show, one of these late night shows, and he's hilarious and charismatic and confident and comfortable, and the audience loves him. And all of that, I think, makes someone like, man, I should vote for this guy. Like, this guy's a good president. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, to what extent do you think, like, the traits that people look for in presidents or leaders more generally, but let's, I'm thinking especially about presidents, are actually pertinent to their effectiveness in office and to what extent are they just general things either that we've evolved to look for in leaders or just things that we like about people or maybe like historically people who seemed like sweet individuals also made good leaders. To what extent do you think there's also a disconnect there? Because you also talked about these like physical features, masculine, face, tall, those seem like they're not really pertinent to whether someone's a good leader as a president. Um, well, I do think there are some sort of collinearity between traits and sometimes one trait can sort of be a proxy for some other traits. But also I would think like the physical formidability is also useful for leaders um, because even a lot of this decision-making that happens, let's say between presidents of nations, uh, it happens oftentimes in a small group and people have to evaluate arguments and make some decision. It's just much higher stakes. But so being physically brought formidable can actually be a benefit in those discussions. But regarding the oratory stuff, so I think there's sort of two things going on. I think oration is also collinear with intelligence and ability to articulate arguments. And that's going to be useful in decision-making and in persuasiveness. And across a lot of smaller scale cultures, uh, persuasiveness is really important because leaders don't really have mechanisms for coercion and manipulation. So they're able to implement decisions because of their ability to formulate a really persuasive argument and capture people's attention. And actually just attention, having attention on you is one way to achieve leadership. And that's actually common across lots of primates um, and including humans. So I think oration, and I'm actually doing a project right on this right now, an EHRAF project with a colleague uh, at Luzon, his name is Sirio Linetti, who's in, actually in management. And so I think oration is sort of collinear with intelligence, which is also related to decision-making. So I think we like these strong speakers because we think that they're probably smarter than we are, and they're probably gonna be able to make a good decision that'll benefit us and convince other people to go along with that decision that will benefit us most of the time. Hmm. That's interesting. As you're kind of talking about figureheads too, I was just thinking, 
something that I've thought a lot about, especially since COVID and the conspiracy theories and people's assessment of uh, of of science and wanting to put a a face on. Uh, uh, there's there's this human perpetu- uh, um, uh, uh, There's this human inclination to uh, propensity to that's the word I was looking for to kind of assign agency to these large chaotic systems whether it's manveer talking about you know some some bad luck happens in the universe a specific person with the face that we know was probably to blame or um it, you, you know we when we think about scientists we think like Oh, Einstein pops in. That's what science looks like. Or, or now Fauci and 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 people will often, uh, whether someone wears a mask or not, is dependent on how much they like Anthony Fauci. Like I like the guy. I'm kind of indifferent about the guy. Like one way or, or not. Like it, just because it doesn't matter to me. It's not. That's not science. It's it's like like it, uh, he's delegating resources and stuff for science to be done but it's it's uh, like it's not the he is not the embodiment of the scientific method and looking for vaccines and all of these uh, but but there's just this inclination to put a i don't know if it's our theory of mind is just so adaptive that we tend to much in the way that we find patterns in places that there aren't we tend to assign agency where there isn't and 5g conspiracies or whatever else happened from the mad scientists are making this stuff to attack us and uh, and some of this does feel like a little bit of a maybe unnecessary byproduct or evolutionary holdover from from traits that may have made a lot of sense um in our in our in our tribal uh, origins, but now, I, I, I mean, Zach, you, you're making the case that there's something within humans that might need that. But part of me is like, well, but do we like, like in the in the way that in the way that we have behavioral economics now, which you kind of mentioned, like, okay, you have these the economics of buying a. This is going to be such a I'll just go on a spiel for a while. You guys can take whatever you want out of this. Um, so whether or not, uh, like from a robotic economics, classic economics point of view, um, uh, to to put a super expensive lobster on a credit card at a restaurant is just like the silliest way, uh, like probably the reason why you even like lobster is because it's scarce just because of overfishing. It, there was a point in our history when people didn't even like lobster because it was too abundant. It was like the garbage of, of, of the ocean. And, and then, uh, and you're not getting as many calories for your buck and it's, it doesn't actually taste as good as you're telling yourself. And should you be putting this on a credit card? But then from this kind of evolutionary biology point of view, you maybe just impressed your date. Maybe, maybe your genes have a better chance of, of, of going, uh, generations into the future because of this one choice that you're making. And so, yes, you're paying 20% interest on this credit card for this thing, but, but there is this kind of evolutionary logic to it. And, and if we kind of understand all of that, we can have this behavioral economics and then, and then adjust our, our decision-making accordingly. And in that same way, we might be able to have a, a, um, a behavioral kind of um, democracy or election system or or uh, how uh, or community building or how we uh, assign leaders and we might be able to in in some perfect uh, world where everyone's very scientifically literate and everything else go. Hey, you know, I kind of want like a guy with a, a like uh, I want Brad Pitt to be president, but like, uh, maybe we should do some sort of double blind study and test and see who actually has what it takes to do this and that. Maybe it shouldn't be one person. Maybe it should be some, 
um, round table sort of situation where you're getting a bunch of you know, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian, and and they're all hashing it out together. And, and this is just this holdover that we have a really, really hard time breaking free of, but is, but is imposing much, much more of a cost because of the mismatch on our, uh, uh, for our, for our modern lives than, than is necessary if we were be able to pull back and kind of scrap everything and start from the beginning. Thoughts, questions, concerns? You brought up two interesting things. One is that people narrate the world according to individuals' actions, um, which I think I think is a huge thing. There was this approach to history in the uh, 19th century called the great man approach to history, the great man theory of history, which is really how a lot of people still narrate history, which is like, this person came to power and then they waged war on that person and their kingdom. And then like this other person came to power and then they waged war back when it's actually like, if we want to actually narrate why history happened, it's much more complicated in the sense of like various institutions are creating incentive structures that like motivate this trend and then whatever. Um, that's only to say that I think you, you point to something really important and interesting there that the, the ways in which we think about individuals driving the world really, really biases how we understand reality. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, there, there's this, there's this, um, uh, there's this inclination to go old MacDonald invented agriculture. And then you go, well, actually agriculture sprung up, uh, in six different regions, independent of one another all around the same time. So there was obviously a lot more going on there than, than the one genius of old MacDonald. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that book, the Scientific Revolutions book by Kuhn, I think. Uh-huh. Um, but over there he talks about, uh, I hope it's Kuhn, but the author talks about how strange this notion of discovery is. Like we're, we're really attached to like who discovered oxygen and we give it a name, but it's actually like one person captured it and then another person gave it the wrong name and then another person like, you know, realized that you could burn it. Another person thought it was three elements. No single person invented oxygen, but we say, oh yeah, or discovered oxygen, but we narrate it exactly as you say that someone discovered oxygen and then someone discovered this and then someone discovered that. Mm. Um, but then your second point, which is also an interesting point that I, I wonder what Zach thinks is this idea of like, if we can identify more efficient political systems, to what extent is the fact that our psychology finds the existing ones compelling or appealing enough of a reason to stay with the inefficient ones. Um, mm. And I remember like this comes up with the morality a lot, that there are some moral intuitions that are not utilitarian, that are maybe inefficient and that reflect just how we think about things. And like a common one is this commission omission bias where, you know, I, the, the train is coming down the tracks. It's about to kill. It can kill you know, one guy over here or two people over there, or sorry, two people over here or one guy over there. And some people will just let it kill more people rather than actually moving it because we moralize and act as, as worse than not acting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I made the choice to, to shift the tracks on the trolley. Right, and... right. But, but just this idea that like, and many people can recognize that. And there are all of these inefficiencies to morality, but we seem uh hesitant of actually addressing those in law mm. of like changing law to be more efficient um because people have these moral intuitions and it will upset them um hmm. like I, I wonder and again maybe this is a question for zach but like zach what do you think would be a more efficient way of governing a country and like do you think that we could instantiate we could manifest it because of one last little interjection setting setting that up, even just in terms of modern history of of uh, you know people need, used to need to ride on horseback and you used to have a representative from your area that like okay I think that guy gets the gist of what our community is about and hopefully we can trust that he's going to communicate that clearly and advocate for us. Uh, to the state, and then and then the state representative will then take his horse to D.C. to, and and now we could very easily get on a app and be like, 
here's what I think about gay marriage. Here's what I think about the stimulus package. Here's what I, and you could theoretically have all of democracy happening every single day and everyone kind of getting a vote on uh, any given individual uh, issue rather than having a representative embodying this checklist that's like, well, you're on this side, so this is what you think about abortion, and this is what you think about economic issues. Well, I think there's, you, you raise a really important point on both of the points you guys just made about how could we, how could we reformat our governing system uh, to maybe actually be more effective, given what we know from a variety of bits of data, theory, psychology, etc. Um, and related to Shane's point, sort of the signaling argument. I mean, I think our minds are very well designed to find domains in which we can all compete for status. I mean, that's what we, it's one thing we all do, whether it be in academics, in sports, um, in whatever, whatever we can possibly find. That's probably a universal feature of all people, um, even though there are a multitude of ways we can go about that. And politics and is one form of status striving. Leadership is one way in which high status people uh, compete for status and maintain influence. And it's sort of the, the billionaire competition. You know, what does $12 billion do compared to $11 billion? Well, it makes you better than the guy with $11.5 billion. Um, so there's that. And so how do we change the incentive structure? How do you disrupt that system that is already has so much momentum behind it? Um, because the politicians who are these individual figureheads, um, they're engaged in th these types of status competitions. Um, and another sort of metaphor that's used, I mean, both of you guys, I'm sure most of your listeners will be familiar with, is like the idea of adaptive landscapes. And so as a system progresses, which could be like, you could think of it as an organism or a, a cultural, something of some feature of culture, uh, selection processes, natural selection or, or cultural evolution selection, is trying to succeed in given a set of constraints and pressures. And you can think of going up a hill as terms of getting a better design, a better phenotype for the organism, or a better cultural system to uh, better institutions to succeed in the environment. But as you go up that hill towards some adaptive peak, some better situation, you get to a point where to get to a higher peak, you'd have to go down in fitness. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we're kind of up at where we've gone up some adaptive peak that now we know it's, it's not the best one because we're smarter, we have more information. But to get that institutional system to this other adaptive peak would probably require so much of a decrease. Um, this is it's really sure difficult. we're having a midlife crisis, but can we really, at our age, could we really go to like medical school and spend twelve years doing this and that, and uh, <laughs> to get the degree to then only have that many years left? Right. So, uh, hmm. I mean, it'd be quite interesting, but this gets a little speculative, you know, about how do, how do we take the applied information from evolutionary theory, informatics, morality, decision making, and institute some way where we can actually make this global system work. But um, yeah, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> hmm. Well, what do in, in um, the people that you, uh, that, that you study, what is a leader doing exactly like it is i i mean we all know that obviously in our modern world we definitely need someone to um communicate very clearly through um all cap tweets at three in the morning uh the important issues uh facing our country but a, a, a leader in a in a tribal community are they I, how much of what they're doing is like ornamental? How much of it is are are they are they judging court? I know Manvir mentioned kind of court cases and things. Are they are they healing? Are they, is it all over the map? Is is every tribe different in in what their leaders do? A little bit of all that. I mean, there's a lot of diversity, but I think just the most basic and probably most common thing is just resolving conflicts for people, because. The, our groups, our social groups, are very heterogeneous. So you've you've got your friends, you've got your kin, your family, but there's a lot of people. So for a long time in anthropology, we had this idea that our ancestral groups were these kin-based societies, 
And that's how cooperation evolved, and that's how a lot of culture evolved, because there was incentives, biological fitness incentives for people to cooperate. Um, but now we know that that's not really the case, and our ancestral groups were probably very different in terms of uh, relationships and types of people in the group. And so I think, and from you know, evidence suggests to me that leaders are really just like keeping the whole fabric of society together on like a day-to-day -day basis, and it's super stressful, and it's super difficult, and they would probably prefer not to be doing it, but somebody absolutely has to do it, or you're going to face all these other threats that you don't want to have to face. And they recognize, and other people recognize, that they're the best person to get the job done. And so they're keeping people from fighting. They're keeping larger kin groups from spiraling out of control and going on um, blood feuds and revenge killings for generations. Or they're making sure there's enough food. Uh, because if you don't plant the crops now, you're not going to have enough food to eat in nine months. And, and things like that. So I think on a day-to-day -day basis, most leaders are just keeping the whole group afloat mm. um all right well gosh i feel like i could talk with you guys forever but we should wrap up soon ish why don't why don't um why don't i just give each of you like five minutes or something to go over some some of uh, what I, I would say are like some of the highlights of your work some of the things that you're most interested in in sharing and then Maybe I'll maybe I'll even sometime next year or something like that have each of you on individually to go a little more in depth because um, I feel like we barely even I, I don't know there's there's just so much to talk about here. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, go for it, man, dear. Okay, so five five minutes is quite a while. About uh, um... well, I'll ask you questions and stuff. Okay. Just just some of the. Like I remember from talking to you in the past, there was like this the fantastic you mentioned the the kind of water monster and the the disease and like that that's a really fun thing that I remember, but it's probably not the bulk of of the work that you do. So I'll, I'll let you steer the ship a little bit. Actually, now that I brought that up, you better first tell people um, about the the water monster and sharing thing that you briefly mentioned earlier because it's super fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a project. So like Zach mentioned, you know, we have all kinds of projects. We do cross-cultural stuff. We do some psychological stuff. Um, yeah, I have projects on music, on shamanism. But this is a project that I kind of treat as like, it's like a, a really nice little friend. That's a weird way to imagine it but i i like love this project and i feel like it's so sweet it's like a little project so anyway where i do field work or i'll take another step back there is this long-standing perspective in anthropology that moralizing gods gods who punish moral infractions are restricted to complex large-scale societies that um for most of history spirits, gods, ancestors didn't really care about moral behavior. They cared about, did you sacrifice these things? Did you um, violate a taboo? But they didn't really care about social interactions. And you find that in some like foundational anthropological texts, and you also find that in like many papers that come out now. But anyway, in that context, I get to the field and like pretty quickly in the field and also afterwards like probing some of the old ethnographies, I learned exactly what you mentioned, this idea that if I don't share meat, um, I will get attacked by a water spirit. And it was very often talked about as a crocodile god, as a crocodile spirit. Um, and the manifestation of that attack can be can take many forms. So it might be that my child goes to swim in the river and drowns, or my child goes to swim in the river and is attacked by a crocodile, or that I will like get very sick and I'll become yellow and I'll feel like something is weighing down on me. So if any of those happen... I will call a shaman and the shaman comes to my house and they engage in the ceremony where I sacrifice pigs, I sacrifice chickens, and, um, and the, song, the shamans essentially sing to the crocodile, to, to this water monster, to this water spirit, to enter a small bowl. And they put out items that the crocodile spirit loves. They put out necklaces and various fabrics and they capture the water spirit, they apologize, and then they walk out and they return it to the water. Um, and I found that 
this belief is really common throughout the island, um, that elements of the ceremony recur throughout the island, that everywhere it's known by the word aunt, so the, the same word for like auntie. Um, and I also had people draw it. I love to have people like, if possible, draw spirits and gods just to get like a sense of what it looks like for them. Um, and this is in the paper, but you see that it takes a couple forms. One, it's very often drawn as a crocodile, but other times it's drawn as like a, a person who has incredibly long hair. Um, and sometimes they're mixed up. So there's one drawing of a crocodile that has very long hair. There's one drawing of like a person who has very long hair, but the body of a crocodile. Anyway, the, the research just shows that in this, in this community, at least, um, people believe in these gods, but those gods... And those gods care about a moral domain, but it's very restricted. It doesn't care about adultery. It doesn't care about stealing. It doesn't care if you're greedy. It just cares, did you share meat with your clan member? And it can't even read your mind. So we know that it can't read your mind because the shamans, when they apologize to it, they say the person meant to share, but the other people were too far. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. It suggests that maybe a major change in the history of religion has not been the, the emergence of a moralizing God, but has been that gods have become more morally promiscuous, that they care about many more moral domains. They care, they're like the moral circle has really expanded. It's not only share with your family, it's be nice to everyone. And they have also become more powerful. So then rather than like crawling into your house and, and you know, weighing down on you or ordering a crocodile to attack you, they can attack you in the afterlife. They can like, you know, mess you up in all kinds of ways. Um, so this is just this one project mm. I had, you know, that I, that I thought was cool. And some things that I liked about it were that I think it really demonstrates how all of these domains of life are really intertangled. So yeah. over here we have theories of illness, we have morality, we yeah. have spirituality, we have the prestigious shamans, um, we have food sharing. All of them are, are really intertangled in ways that are maybe unfamiliar to a lot of people, maybe to a lot of people listening or watching. You know, at least to me, those are not things that are tangled in that way. But it's also like it's so close to so many things. You got if you have say like a waterborne illness, but you don't consciously know that's what's going on. But there's that's like a pattern that that you've kind of picked up on or have this aversion to or whatever. And then kind of the dramatized version of that is some water monster, and then and then you're and then you know to to have something bad happened and to want to have especially something as chaotic as an illness where uh, you know who knows what you can do about it to to want to have this semblance of of predictability or control over something to feel like you're doing something and uh, and then to kind of use that to police and reinforce these other aspects that are i imagine altruism it, it, you know, if if humans are pretty altruistic, it, uh, it, it probably evolved for a reason, as did the moralizing of altruism. And so it's a, it's a lot of like, like, oh, that was close, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then a few things just getting confounded a, a little bit. I mean, to me, it doesn't sound that much different than um, COVID happening and people being like, well, it's it's an obesity problem. We should just do more push-ups and and stuff like that. I was like, well, it's really that's you know that's zeroing in on something. It's it, it's health related and and it's it, it's giving people that's giving people some like sense of hey, if we work out each day, that will maybe be this protective thing uh, against this. Yeah, I mean, I also just building on things that have come up throughout the conversation and this is like really maybe you're also saying this but it's it's very analogous to you know covid is x person's fault or yeah covid is is punishment or like you know these people kind of deserve to get hit it's either con putting some kind of morality into it but also putting some kind of agency into it um, yeah there's a chinese virus but then there's these mega super spreaders and they're uh, uh, there it's it's their racism's like part of the problem of spreading the disease or whatever yeah I, I mean it really reflects these two things we were talking about one is like something goes wrong i narrativize it often by pointing to another person 
Yeah. But also, once I have created that narrative, once I'm feeling this misfortune, a leader or an expert can come in, they can harness my explanatory model, provide me with a service, and kind of in doing so, promote their own status. Not necessarily intentionally, but you know, you come mm-hmm. with this story of something goes wrong in your life, and now I come, and whatever your story is, I can imbi- I can be the savior. So, you know, COVID was caused by MAGA super spreaders. I can, you know, get rid of MAGA super spreaders or put them on lockdown, whatever, whatever your model is, I become the savior by vanquishing that model. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that kind of promotes, I think, and also the the shaman status in the community. Oh, well, okay. Well, let's, let's switch back to, I mean, that was, gosh, that's such a, fascinating thing that it ended up there is your whole five minutes man beer and now we, now we don't get to okay i'll give you another uh, chance at the end to talk about some of your other work but zach why don't you why don't you give a spiel of some of the things that you've been excited about lately with your research um yeah so a, a lot of my work so far has been designed to test these theories of leadership using empirical data sources either going to ethiopia and hanging out with people or doing these cross-cultural tests these cross-cultural studies And in doing this, this has kind of led us to what we think is a new theoretical approach to understanding human leadership and prestige. And this is work, this is a a novel theory I'm working on with my uh, former PhD advisor and colleague, Ed Hagen, who your listeners might recall from a couple of previous episodes. Um, I don't have time to tell you the whole background about why, how we got here, but I can kind of tell you the idea briefly. Um, So... All human societies are basically these groups of groups. And the most fundamental group of any human population is the nuclear family. And there's some speculation about what the ancestral human population might have looked like. Um, But regardless, it's always going to be some groups of families. So Mm. uh, our typical model of hunter-gatherer groups, which may or may not be right, but is that, you know, a few families live together to support subsistence. You know, hunting is, is, is risky, so you have to sort of pool your risk. And then sometimes a few of these hunting and gathering bands will, will sort of develop relationships for defense from other groups. And so there's sort of this modular expansion of the human family. And we think that probably goes back you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years across human evolution and across hominid evolution. And so what is the primary function that leaders would have had to have done across this period of time? Well, it's resolving conflicts, but it's also offering these decision-making services. And in thinking about what we see leaders in these small-scale societies doing, it's, it's being intelligent, it's making decisions, they have special knowledge, high, they're, highly, they're believed to be highly intelligent. And we realize that that's actually what human mothers are doing almost all the time on a daily basis. Basically, every woman in a natural fertility, subsistence-based population is managing the household. They have usually three or four kids at a time, um, a few adolescents, a few toddlers, you know, a, a newborn, and there's a high, that's a high, highly demanding problem solving situation to be able to basically be a leader of all these kids, make decisions that will benefit everyone, benefit the mother in a reproductive sense, benefit all the kids in a you know, biological reproductive sense, but also in a social cultural sense. And so it seems like every woman is the leader of the family. And that's actually been overlooked by a lot of leadership scholars. And so what we therefore propose is that any selection pressure for human-specific leader-follower psychology probably originated in these selective pressures for the cognitive demands of motherhood. Because being mother is so difficult, uh, infant mortality is, is so high in most human contexts over evolutionary history. So moms really have to make good decisions on a daily basis to keep kids alive, keep the family going. Um, those same decision-making mechanisms, those same psychological mechanisms would also be useful to be the leader of the group, of the residential group or of the subsistence group. But you don't need that many leaders of the group per se. So we think that selection pressures for the cognitive demands of motherhood contributed to the evolution of the human brain and the evolution of the cognitive processes that underlie leadership. And then once groups, once families come together and you have groups of groups forming, uh, then, you know, one man who's otherwise, in a lot of, a lot of situations, men don't have to do a whole lot. Um, then you can have one guy who is high on these, we call it 
joint utility improvement. So making decisions that improve the outcomes for many people in like a jointly maximizing way. Uh, one man who can do that really effectively tends to be the leader of the group. And so we root the evolution of human leadership basically in these cognitive demands, um, these computational services, we call them, uh, in selective pressures that originate within the demands of motherhood, basically. Fascinating. Um, why not just put a lady in charge? Uh, exactly. <laughs> we like what mothers are doing. <laughs> Can we have a guy that will do that? Um, uh, all right. Well, uh, Manbeer, uh, did you have a did you have an exciting project that you wanted to share before we take off? An exciting project. Um, in the last, so I, I have a bunch of things, but one thing is essentially really everything we've been talking about, which is in the last like month and a half or so, I've really become interested in, again, everything we've been talking about. How is it that when misfortune happens in people's lives, they, they create narratives and then leaders can, can co-opt those narratives or harness those narratives to present themselves as saviors. Um, and that came out and present themselves as saviors and then just gain status by like providing these services. And that came out of thinking about shamans, but then also thinking about money managers. You know, I want to control something like the market. I'm convinced that there's some underlying force. This individual comes up and they say, hey, I can control that. Um, I can see into whatever process is there. And they essentially embody our expectation of an expert. And then it just kind of like blew up where I'm now convinced increasingly that this, this dynamic of me creating very simple stories for why things go wrong and other people presenting themselves as saviors can help us explain things like prophets, cult leaders, political revolutionaries, um, demagogues. All yeah. of these are, are, are instances where like someone, what, what leaders are doing in, men, in many ways are they're providing these services and for them to be compelling the, the best thing they can do is, is um, like hack whatever models that we are presenting them with. And so as long as we are creating these very simplistic stories for why things go wrong, um, the leader can just present themselves as the savior to vanquish that. So an example, I was reading the other day about Boko Haram, um, this Nigerian group. And it grew up in a time where like people in Nigeria are really, were were suffering some kind of economic downturn and they were distrustful of the West. Boko Haram literally means, oh, I forgot what Boko means. Maybe it means education, but Haram means forbidden. So it, I think it means education is forbidden. Um, mm. And so it came during this time where people are highly distrustful of the West. And so you have this charismatic figure, um, I think his name was Yusuf Muhammad, who says, okay, like everything is, you know, you're, 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 suffering misfortune and i know you're distrustful of the west the west is behind why things are going wrong the west is contaminating us it's it's bringing in all of these ideas it's it's contaminating the purity of islam i have what it takes to remove the west from nigeria i have what it takes to bring islam and nigeria back to this purified state um and i only mention that as one example of of you have this prophet revolutionary figure who emerges and takes this movement to, to something beyond what it could have otherwise been by doing what shamans are doing, by becoming the savior to vanquish the simplistic stories that we devise for why things are going wrong. Yeah. I, 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 I often, I mean, I think I, people have speculated that kind of some of the modern stock market is is very much like this kind of mythical throwing chicken bones sort of situation that someone someone's just standing up and telling the most simplistic narrative about it and like well you better care about the numbers going up or down on this thing and and um and gaining power by by doing that in in today's modern western society yeah yeah no i think that's a I think that's very much what's going on. I think yeah. that's like a great example of that. Uh, well, amazing, guys. I feel like we could talk for two more hours, but then I'd probably faint. I'm, I need to go and have some lunch. 
Um, thank you so much for uh, joining me. You guys are both fantastic. Zach Garfield and Manveer Singh. Do you guys have sites you'd like to direct people to or social media stuff? Zach, I think you have like some weird name on Instagram, so you must... You, um, you, is that a is that like a secret account or something, or something like that? No, you're on, actually, you're on Twitter. Like a, I'm on Twitter. It's actually a play on a Jimi Hendrix song if six was nine. But um, um, they can find, yeah, Twitter. I'm ZH Garfield. But um, yeah, a lot of our colleagues have interesting discussions oftentimes on Twitter. So that's a good place to find find us. Awesome. Manvir? Yeah, I'm also on Twitter. It's my name without vowels. M-N-V-R-S-N-G-H. Awesome. Uh, everyone follow them there. And yeah, thanks for joining me. Thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. Bye.